One of Nietzsche's most exciting ideas with reference to life affirmation is the one that he calls eternal occurrence or the eternal return of the same. It's introduced in a couple of his works. Uh, for example, it gets a notable place in Zarathustra as one of Zarathustra's main teachings. But perhaps the most famous introduction is in his book, The Gay Science, where he writes, What if some day or night a demon were to steal after you in your loneliest loneliness and say to you, This life as you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerably times more, and there will be nothing new in it but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything unutterably small or great in your life, will have to return to you, all in the same succession and sequence. Even this spider, and this moonlight between the trees, even this moment, and I myself. The eternal hourglass of existence is turned upside down again and again, and you with it, speck of dust. Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or have you once experienced a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you are a God, and I never have heard anything more divine. If this thought gained possession of you, it would change you as you are, or perhaps crush you. The question in each and every thing, do you desire this once more and innumerable times more, would lie upon your actions as the greatest weight? Or how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life to crave nothing more fervently than this ultimate confirmation and seal. The idea of time being a circle is actually a very ancient one, and it recurs in a number of cultures. The ancient Aztecs and Mayans, for instance, had a notion of the world being destroyed many times and then being recreated. And similar ideas occur also in India. Nietzsche was probably most familiar with the idea in its currency in antiquity among the Greeks in particular. For example, Heraclitus had a kind of vision of eternal recurrence, as did the Stoics. And the Pythagoreans seem to have a view that in many ways conforms to the passage that Bob just read, the idea of events repeating themselves cyclically in exactly the same order. One of the reasons that I think Nietzsche might have found this idea so interesting is in part because of its deep-rooted um, past in the history of humanity. But also, the fact was that Christianity had turned against this idea. And therefore, I think it has a certain kind of animus against the Christian orthodoxy, too, when Nietzsche brings it up. The reason that the idea was rejected by Christianity, and indeed the early Christians did have a number of debates about this, was that if you really believe that Jesus redeemed mankind and had taken away the sin of the world, it didn't make a lot of sense to have this happen over and over again. Um, this had to be a one-time historical event. So in order to really believe the story of atonement and redemption, the view became cemented that there was, in fact, only one time, and that time, in fact, was linear. The idea of time as a circle, time as linear, of course carried Nietzsche back into physics, which he did keep up with. And as Kathy mentioned in the last lecture, the move in physics at the end of the 19th century was to get away from the sort of Newtonian talk about mechanism and matter in motion, and instead to talk about energy, and in particular talking about energy packets and little points of energy. And Nietzsche actually, in his notes, and let me emphasize, only in his unpublished notes, plays with the idea of an actual physical proof of eternal re recurrence. It goes like this. Time is infinite. Now, let's leave aside a contradiction that's already evident, that if time is a circle, it's not infinite in the linear sense, which this argument presupposes. But time is infinite. There's a finite number of, num of energy packets in the world, and consequently a finite number of sequences of energy packets. And so, in the infinity of time, the number of sequences is going to have to repeat itself an infinite number of times. Now let's not worry about the mathematics of it, but there's an obvious flaw in the proof right from the outset. Insofar as this is supposed to be 
something which, as everything in Nietzsche is supposed to, influences our lives and the way we live, if it's supposed to have the weight that he refers to in the quotation that I read, then it has to make some difference, whether it's this sequence or perhaps some other sequence, whether I am me myself or I am someone else or not at all. But if, in fact, there is this infinite repetition, there is also the infinite repetition of every other energy sequence as well, so that not just this life, but every possible life that I could lead or any possible life without me would also repeat an infinite number of times, which I think takes the steam out of the argument. But Nietzsche never published this, and I think it's a good thing he didn't. It's like one of those notes that we write ourselves all the time, often on the napkin of the coffee shop or whatever, and we get home and we look at it and we think, this idea is really silly, I don't know what made me think of it. And Nietzsche was certainly wise not to publish this particular proof. But that doesn't mean he didn't believe in eternal recurrence. He certainly thought that this was one of his most fascinating thought experiments. And the idea is, as the suggestion in the quote, suge uh, uh, as, the, as the quote suggests, is that if you take this thought seriously, that your life as you are now leading it is going to be repeated an infinite number of times, then the weight it gives to this life and to the moments of this life is incalculable compared to the Christian image that this life is but a blink. It's but a moment in time. And it's the next life, the eternal life, that gets all the weight. Milan Kundera, the great uh, contemporary Czech novelist, picks up on this theme and he uses it both, both as a title and the starting meditation of his great book, um, Unbearable Lightness of Being. And it has to do with the notion of events repeating themselves an infinite number of times and consequently having a certain amount of weight. So we think about our lives and the question is, would we tolerate the idea of that much weight on the way we live? Instead of rationalizing, as we so often do, well, this will be over soon, or this is only a couple years of my life, then I'll get to do what I really want to do, or it's just this life, and of course this is suffering and toil and ultimately meaningless in its own terms, but there's another life, a more perfect life, awaiting for me somewhere else. Instead of that kind of thinking, what if we really took the moments of our lives seriously? The result is a kind of a test. It's also a psychological hypothesis. And one might think of it in the following way, and let me give here a very personal antidote. It's, oh, some, I hate to say it, 30 years ago, when I was a student in medicine, and I was aiming it to be a doctor. I love science, but to tell you the truth, I hated medical school. And working in hospitals, as one did in medical school in those days, right from the start, I realized very quickly that I really didn't like being around sick people. And I didn't like a lot of the people in my medical school class who were a little bit too anxious for money and the kind of then absolute authority that doctors had in the world. This is before malpractice suits. There was a sense in which I kind of hated everything about it. And let me add, so I'm not misunderstood, I have great respect for doctors, I love my own doctor. But nevertheless, I came to realize, though very slowly at that time, that this wasn't me. That I love science, but medicine was not what I was really meant to do. During that time, I was attending the lectures of the man from whom I eventually got my PhD over in the philosophy department. And as I sat listening to him talk about a philosopher whose name I didn't learn to spell, actually, and in particular, about two-thirds of the way through the term, talking about this curious idea called eternal recurrence, he said to me and a hundred other students pretty much what I've just read to you. What if your life, every moment of suffering and pain and so on, you had to live over and over and over again. And I was indeed very unhappy and unhappy with myself at that time. Well, you can guess the ending of this story. Within 15 minutes after the class ended, I was off to the dean, 
and I quit medical school. I went into philosophy, and I never regretted it ever since. The idea is that eternal occurrence gives us a way of thinking about our own lives, because I was really guilty of thinking. I hate this, but only a few more years, and then I get to, what, be an intern, and then I get to be a resident, and then I get to work in a hospital and work off my debts. Of course, my father encouraged that kind of thinking, but I came to realize that it was really self-destructive for me, and if this was a life I had to lead over and over again, then I had to live it a different way. And so the power in my own personal case, I think, was astounding. It changed my life. And here's an idea that Nietzsche throws out. Granted, he's talking about the will to power. Granted, he's talking about these other notions which may seem abstract to us. But when you try to apply them to your own case, they can have a powerful impact as an existential imperative. I think this kind of test is, in a sense, a kind of Nietzschean alternative to the Christian examination of conscience, where indeed one is always looking forward to the next life and considering the details of this life always in terms of the next. I think that's one of the reasons that Nietzsche usually presents eternal recurrence in the form of something like a thought experiment. This idea of a demon coming to one in the middle of the night is not intended to be a terrifying picture of what actually will happen, but a kind of way of taking a perspective on your life. I think that also might explain why Nietzsche made so many notes suggesting something like a physical proof of eternal recurrence even if he recognized that this would never make these days the scientific American. I think what he had in mind was that we're so used to thinking of life as something that is led from past to future and in a single line and exists once and is altogether over that it's almost impossible for us to really fully internalize a much more traditional vision that actually many of our ancestors in most societies had. The idea that time was actually a circle now, one of the reasons that people have difficulty dealing with this idea in Nietzsche is that it seems that it might make the meaning of life pretty questionable. After all, oftentimes we think that it makes a lot of difference that we learn to overcome our faults and improve in certain ways. Nietzsche himself would encourage that. So what good is a story that says, well, actually, sooner or later you'll come back to that beginning point where you haven't mastered this at all and you'll have to move uphill again? Worse yet, from the standpoint of the traditional story, it seems that there's really not a lot of freedom. It's often pointed out by Nietzsche scholars that if this really were a, a time that recurred eternally, and there was no difference between an occurrence uh, the first time and its recurrence, we wouldn't know which this was. In fact, there'd be no way of differentiating this life, which we think we're doing as a kind of improvisation now, from a life that's been led hundreds, thousands, eternally times, eternal times before. And if that's true, it seems that we don't really have much choice about the way we live, that we're all part of a pre-programmed sequence. I think Nietzsche turned in a way to physics as at least one arena that might explain things in terms of causal interconnection, where things do operate in methodical sequences, in a way that doesn't strike anyone as questioning the meaning of life, Partly it also points out that if we, if we doubt the cyclical model, and physics would say the cyclical model makes sense, we really obviously are living with a lot of prejudice if we insist on the notion of linear time. And actually, if one thinks about the Big Bang Theory, I think there is a sense in which physics actually would be on Nietzsche's side here. But overall, there's a kind of deep prejudice against the idea of eternal recurrence in the Judeo-Christian world, because we do want some sense of freedom, of free will, Nietzsche has a tendency to look at free will, as it's been described in the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition, as really a kind of effort to deflect blame, oddly enough. If we have a notion that human beings are free in their choices, that they have alternatives, and they make the choices they do because they've been free to do so, then we can always blame people when they do the wrong thing. Although it might look as though this notion of free will gives us reason to criticize ourselves, and indeed it does, what it ultimately leads to, Nietzsche thinks, is a kind of general reinforcement of the idea of looking outside you to find fault or to shift blame, uh, a kind of way of uglifying the whole world around one. By contrast, he thinks the vision of eternal recurrence 
creates a very different attitude toward the world and the whole life in which one lives. He talks about this concept in, the ex in terms of the expression amor fati, which we brought up earlier, the notion of love of fate. He comments, I want to learn more and more to see as beautiful what is necessary in, th in things. Then I shall be one of those who make things beautiful. Amor fati, let that be my love henceforth. What that suggests is that Nietzsche sees the model of eternal recurrence, which interconnects all events with all others, really, as providing a kind of way of looking at reality as intricately interconnected in a way that resembles the way a marvelous artwork has all the parts intimately interconnected. That it's a way of seeing as beautiful each element because it takes meaning within the context of the whole and gives the whole a part of its life. In a sense, it gives a kind of vision of the individual that connects the individual with the larger picture, but without denying the individual its own unique contribution. I think Nietzsche sees that as a very forceful and powerful idea, and one that tends to make our vision of reality more profound and more beautiful. On the other hand, how does this tie in with the notion of freedom? It's quite clear that Nietzsche doesn't think that we're free in a completely radical sense. He does think that human beings are motivated by some basic forces within them, basic drives, and that we're not free not to experience those things. The primary freedom he thinks that we have is really in what way do we deal with these internal drives? Do we express them directly or not? We have some choice about that. And in particular, we have some choice about whether we view ourselves as hapless victims of these forces or as active participants in life. And if freedom is a matter that concerns him, it's a matter of feeling free to really actively engage with your life, to deal with life in the present, despite all the things that are, are already settled about it, despite all the details of the present that you're not in any position to change, but to really take your role in the present in as active a possible way, in a sense, to really fully be yourself. That's the only kind of freedom that he thinks really makes sense for human beings to want. But fortunately, he thinks it's a kind of freedom that is really quite available to us. One of our friends, a poet who worked for some years with Joseph Campbell, wrote an essay on death in which he referred to it as bold scenario. And it can be very simply stated. It's our tendency to think of well, we live, and then we die. Boom. Nothing. End of story. And she contrasts this with the many myths and legends of ancient times and medieval times and other cultures, some of them still ongoing strong. And all of them have a talk about life, not necessarily in terms of an afterlife, and that's too often the only alternative that we think of, but rather in terms of an enrichment of life. Uh, seeing life, for example, repeating through one's children, not a literal repetition of your life, perhaps, but in a very important sense, an extension and expression of yourself, or the repetition of yourself in the culture that you live in, or the repetition, uh, the repetition of yourself in some uh, divine or sacred manner, which is open to all sorts of religious interpretations. But the basic idea of saying yes to life also includes such things as an acceptance of death, but an acceptance of death not as simply final, although, believe me, Nietzsche did not accept the Christian notion of the afterlife. Nevertheless, he was very clear that there is a sense of immortality which is available, and available in particular to those who really excel. It's a notion that goes back to Plato, at least, and certainly one could take it long before that, but in his dialogue, The Symposium, which I talked about with reference to Love, Lecture 14, um, what, what we find is uh, Homer being referred to as an immortal. Not that Homer had children. We don't know if he did or not. We don't even know for sure if there was a Homer. But Homer is immortal through his children, through his works. That is, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And Socrates states in the Symposium, who could possibly want any children compared to those? And the answer, I think, for Nietzsche is that he, too, thought of his life in terms of a kind of ongoing repetition, if you like, a repetition of his life 
not in the same way and not the same lonely, sick man coming to life again and going through the same travails, but there's a sense in which Nietzsche saw his works themselves as his immortality. And his frequent comments, sometimes even very narcissistic comments about himself as a buffoon and why doesn't he succeed like Jesus and so on. Um, nevertheless, I think you can see this in a different light. And that is that what Nietzsche was aiming at was to give meaning to his life by doing something that went beyond his life. And doing great works is perhaps the best way to do that. Indeed, this is a, a very clear case of Nietzsche's not attempting to say for, in any kind of clear way what sorts of ambitions would or wouldn't amount to trying to have influence beyond oneself. He leaves it entirely open. He thinks some people do it through having children, through building institutions, through planting trees. There are many ways in which an individual reaches beyond their finite lifespan into the future and into this whole cycle of time that's going to proceed before one. And indeed, the myth, in a sense, recreates one throughout the entire timeline. You can almost see the idea of time as a circle as suggesting that there's no absolute point where your existence fully ends or begins. True, there's a sense in which we do have a sense of ending with death, but that's only a provisional ending. There's also no particular moment where one is judged absolutely. And this, too, he sees as a kind of deficit in the uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, where the point of death is a point at which judgment comes completely, um, that you're, the state of your soul at that point is the final determinant of your salvation or damnation. Instead, eternal recurrence is a vision in which each moment in the timeline is as important as every other and also has a kind of reflection or influence on all the others. Uh, one exists in a way as a drop of water in a wave, but one has, in a sense, the whole life of the wave as part of one's own reality. And that he takes very seriously. So he thinks this is a, a very important idea because it provides an alternative, an alternative to the traditional view from his background to a way of looking at the individual's life as being meaningful in a kind of full sense, but not one that depends on a notion of eternal life after the grave as being a way of getting that. Aristotle considers in his ethics the curious question whether a person can be called happy until he's dead, or for that matter, even after. It's a curious question because when we think of happiness, we think of it as a state of mind, and the current American answer would be, of course, when you're dead, you're finished being happy. Uh, but that's it. What Aristotle had in mind, of course, wasn't simply feeling happy, but Aristotle had in mind a word that's usually translated as flourishing. But I think in Nietzschean terms, we might think of it as a kind of self-realization uh, in terms of one Greek poet he admires, Pindar, becoming who you are. But that's not something that ends with death. Aristotle, in his musings, considers the following example. A man who is greatly respected in Athens, dies, but his children then rebel against the state or are involved in some deep scandal, besmirching the family name. There's a sense in which the events after the man's death deeply affect his flourishing. He may be dead, but nevertheless, what's important about him, what is surviving about him, is his reputation, his good name, his family, and now through the behavior of his children, that's been ruined. So too, Nietzsche sees quite clearly that what he is and his becoming, who he can be, doesn't end with his rather pathetic death in 1900, but rather is going on even as we lecture and what we make of him and what you make of him. There's a sense in which what it means to be immortal, what it means to live on and repeat your life, has to do with the way in which you continue to survive. Now, with Nietzsche, we have a name to attach. With most people, in a sense, they disappear from history. But nevertheless, as Kathy used in this Taoist image of the drop in the wave, nevertheless, they continue to exist in the wave itself. Now, Aristotle has another notion, which I think is very relevant here, as a way of starting to bring this all to a close. We've repeated many times Pinder's phrase, become who you are, and we've related this to Nietzsche's 
perhaps ill-chosen phrase, the will to power, saying that what he means by will to power is ultimately a kind of self-expression and self-realization. But all this really leaves open the question, now what exactly does Nietzsche want us to be? Well, this is made problematic by the fact that he refuses, in effect, to give us any concrete advice. And we quoted Zarathustra now several times, don't follow me, just find your own way. Find out what's inside of you. But there is something that Nietzsche says in Gay Science which I think is extremely valuable in this sense. And that is, give style to your character, the great art. Now what that means is not fashion, it's not sort of being stylish, but rather it's making something of what you have and who you are. The notion of fate that Kathy just brought up again, and the love of fate, has to do with something that many of us find fairly difficult. Namely, loving who you are and loving what you've got to work with. That doesn't mean being satisfied or content. What it means is loving, accepting what you've got to work with and then making something beautiful out of it. When we were talking about resentment and slave morality, one of the points we made was that what the slave does is takes his flaws and turns those flaws in a way into weapons by redescribing them as good. And that's distinctive of slave mentality of resentment. But this is something very different. One of the examples that Nietzsche uses, which I'm sure was tongue-in-cheek, was Napoleon's speech impediment, which in his position of power he employed as a way of making people pay attention to him all the more. And if you think about Nietzsche himself, here's a very sick, lonely man. What do you do when you're physically ill. What do you do when you find yourself temperamentally or circumstantially just alienated from other people? And what Nietzsche did was he gave shape to himself. One of our favorite Nietzsche scholars and a good friend has argued that what Nietzsche does basically is what Plato does with Socrates. That what he did was he gave shape to himself as an author, as what we now know as Nietzsche, and in a way the man with the mustache becomes almost irrelevant to the creation that Nietzsche has become. In a way, it's all an art of transfiguration. And I think transfiguration, despite or perhaps even because of its resonance with the Christian background, is a term that uh, explains a lot of what Nietzsche sees as desirable in living. It's taking your own traits and giving them a setting. I'm reminded of Messian writing a composition while in a concentration camp where there were musicians who played various instruments that normally wouldn't be in an ensemble together. And yet, taking the resources he has, he creates this masterpiece. In a sense, Nietzsche thinks all of us have that as a kind of project that we can engage in with ourselves. In a way, he does follow Aristotle, who thinks we are born with certain kinds of traits or temperamental endowments, but we wouldn't really call those virtues, even if they're endowments people like, until we've gained some control over them and find, found the right occasions to use the particular traits we have. Say someone is born with a very, a disposition toward a hot temper. That can be a problem for the person and for those around the person. On the other hand, it can be directed in a way that makes that person a really powerful influence on his or her society. Um, if you take a kind of tendency toward anger and turn that into motivation to work for a cause, say, that can sometimes work to stellar results, both for oneself and for others. And again, this notion that the distinction between individual and the community is overplayed, an idea that Nietzsche has, should be, it should be recognized in this connection that Nietzsche does think that the individual does play off other people and vice versa. In fact, in the passage where he talks about giving style to one's character, he concludes by saying the important thing is that a person takes some satisfaction in himself or herself. If not, all the rest of us will be his or her victims. And I think that what he has in mind there is that none of us are really um, so much an island as we come to think of ourselves. Again, this is an argument against the Christian vision where the individual soul has its own vocation. For Nietzsche, it really is the here and now in the community. We'll conclude with one of his final statements of eternal recurrence. 
Whoever has really gazed down with an Asiatic and super-Asiatic eye into the most world-denying of all possible modes of thought, beyond good and evil, and no longer like Buddha and Schopenhauer under the spell and illusion of morality, perhaps by this very act, without really desiring it, may have opened his eyes to the opposite ideal, the ideal of the most high-spirited, energetic, and world-affirming man, who has not only learned to come to terms with and assimilate with what, what it was and is, but who wants to have it again, as it was and is, to all eternity, insatiably calling out, once more. Thanks. <laughs>